What's up, traders? Anthony Cardelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. In today's episode, I'm joined by Darius Dale. He is the founder and CEO of 42 Macro, offering a comprehensive proprietary model that helps investors manage risk and receive portfolio guidance through macro forecasting models and quantitative signals. In today's episode, we explore the sticky inflation theme and its effects on various asset classes and investment strategies. We'll also discuss expectations for rate cuts, key macroeconomic factors, and Darius Dale's perspective on gold and commodities. If you're a trader or investor seeking an in-depth analysis of the current market landscape, you won't want to miss this conversation. Today's podcast is sponsored by FTSE Russell and TradeStation. FTSE Russell is the home of the Russell 2000 Index. Did you know that with an 81% share and $1.6 trillion in institutional assets benchmarked, the Russell 2000 is the top choice by far among institutional investors. Like all Russell U.S. indexes, it's rules-based, transparent, and reliable. Regularly updated with the latest IPOs and annually rebalanced. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please go to FTSERussell.com. Serious futures traders, level up your skills with TradeStation's powerful platform. Enjoy flexibility, superior trading power, and save big with 50% off brokerage fees for the life of your account and get 10% intraday margin rates on three popular futures markets. Open a new futures account today at TradeStation.com slash Anthony. So, DD, great to have you back on the show, my brother. Anthony, man, it's such a pleasure to be back with you, man. I always love chopping it up with you, brother. I love chatting with you. I'm a huge fan of your work. Uh, you've taught me a lot. And we're here really on a special day for you and really a special day for the markets. I think we guys just got to get right into it. I mean, we finally are starting to see markets react to some inflationary data that we've been getting, you continue to see rates upticking here. I think it is a factor and obviously geopolitical headwinds. It's not like they've really been too quiet. I mean, when people forget there's still a war going on and, and the market, I, I think, is starting to react to, to all of these things. What say you? Yeah, I think that's the general perception out there is that the market is starting to react to that. From our perspective, I think this was a long time coming. One of the things we did uh, heading into the month of April was flagged for our clients that our positioning model uh, was flagging elevated risk of a, of a tactical pullback in asset markets. And part of the reason for that is the shorter term, more tactical indicators that we feature in our positioning model, uh, namely things like the AI bulls bear spread. Uh, we look at implied correlations, the, the AI cash allocation, those types of um, more tactical uh, indicators were suggesting that this is a market that was very overstretched from the perspective of, you know, kind of short term price momentum. And so from our perspective, uh, whether it be uh, a deterioration in the, um, you know, in what's going on in the Middle East or any other geopolitical activity, uh, any other negative geopolitical catalyst, in our opinion, you know, whether it be that or a squirrel getting hit by a bus, we would have had a pullback in asset markets from our perspective. Now, from a medium term perspective, we are still in a risk on reflation market regime. And our, from our perspective, in our humble you know, opinion, it's going to be you're going to be hard pressed to undo a risk on market regime with mere geopolitical catalysts alone. What you need to do in order to undo that risk on market regime is actually uh, cause the themes that have really contributed to that re regime uh, to go by the wayside. And there are four themes currently that are active uh, that are continuing to contribute to that outcome. And so number one would be the resilient U.S. economy theme that we authored in the summer of 2022. That's persistent. Uh, number two uh, would be the China front loading stimulus theme uh, that we authored in, in mid-December of 2023. That persists. Our green shoots globally theme, which we authored in January. Uh, that persists and then our jay and janet want a soft landing theme uh, which dates back to december uh, in terms of uh, the fed and, and treasury looking like they want to continue to supply a liquidity to asset markets at least here in this election year uh, that is persistent i think you need to get rid of one or more of those themes in order to have what we call a row row phase transition which is going from a risk on and or risk off market regime to it to the opposite to opposite condition and i don't know that we're there yet so what is or has been your recommendation 
in terms of positioning for these themes? Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm there. showing you is a screenshot of our risk management process. So in terms of how we help clients stay on the right side of market risk, you know, it's a three-step process and I'll get to answer your question, Anthony, in the second half of this. Uh, but the first step is identifying and positioning for the market regime. As I mentioned, we're currently in a risk on reflation market regime. Uh, the second step of that process is helping investors prepare for regime change using quantitative signals. We do that with our macro weather model, which is a rolling three-month return projection for each of the major asset classes. And then we help investors prepare for regime change using qualitative signals, i.e. the signals that we just talked about, those fundamental themes. And so when uh, to answer your question specifically, Anthony, when we are in a risk on reflation market regime, uh, you generally want to be long risk assets, short defensive assets, high beta tends to outperform low beta, cyclicals tend to outperform defensives, growth tends to outperform value, small and mid caps tend to outperform large caps, uh, international tends to outperform US, emerging markets tend to outperform developed markets, within the fixed income markets, you, spread products tend to outperform treasuries. If you're going to be in the treasury curve, short rates tend to outperform the belly, which tend to outperform uh, long rates, which all three have negative absolute returns. A uh, high yield tends to outperform investment grade, and in the commodity space, industrial commodities tend to outperform energy commodities, which tend to outperform ag commodities, but they all have positive absolute returns. And then in the currency market, uh, the foreign currencies tend to outperform the U.S. dollar. And so, and, and you know, from our perspective, you know, when you're in a in any market regime, generally speaking, the bets that you are making as an investor, at least at the bare minimum, the incremental bets, but we'd argue most of the bets you should be making uh, should be in accordance with these factor long short preferences. And so uh, from my perspective, you know, trying to identify whether or not, okay, this is the start of a new regime or not, uh, has less to do with, you know, sort of the short term tactical pullback that we're seeing in asset markets. And again, more to do with the fact weather model and our qualitative research suggesting about regime change on a go forward basis. And, and to, you know, going back to our conclusion earlier, we have not observed enough data fundamentally, nor have we have observed enough deterioration in either our global macro risk matrix, which we use to now cast the market regime, or the macro weather model, which we use to, uh, you know, roll that that mark where you now cast into the future, we have not seen enough change yet to say we need to do something. Uh, investors need to do something materially different in their portfolio. So just, you know, just deal with the correction as it comes. So, what are the most significant macroeconomic factors influencing the market today, and does your model account for variables such as the geopolitical risk and the potential impact for even an election year, which is going to start heating up here, DD? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yes, our model accounts for everything, right? So, let me go back into the slide deck where we show our global macro risk matrix, and so we use our global macro risk matrix to now cast the market regime. Uh, and how this process works is we are scoring uh, each of the, the 42 most important asset markets, at least from my, my own anecdotal perspective and my experience on Global Wall Street. Uh, we're scoring each of them from the perspective of our volatility adjusted momentum signal. And they were doing that in the context of how the asset has historically performed uh, in each of those grid regimes, Goldilocks, uh, reflation, inflation, and deflation, with inflation and deflation being the, the risk off regimes, and Goldilocks and reflation being the risk on regimes. And so in terms of how this process works, uh, is we are, you know, again, every day uh, we score the, the volatility just momentum signal for that particular asset and then relate that back to how the asset is historically performed based on our back testing. And so right now, the uh, bullish BAMS indication for the S&P 500 today gives a point to each uh, go to each uh, Goldilocks and reflation because the S&P tends to have positive absolute returns in those regimes. You know, for example, so right now, uh, this morning, the UK one year overnight index swap rate just broke back out to bullish, joining a lot of other fixed income rates and spreads over the past few weeks uh, in terms of breaking out. And that gives one point to both inflation and reflation because historically you've seen positive returns uh, in that particular macro factor uh, over the last throughout the lifetime of the back test. And so, you know, answering your question, you know, have we seen some changes or, you know, kind of what what in our process would help us identify those changes? It's all 42 of these markets. Right. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty smart, intelligent guy. You are as well, Anthony. But the reality is not the two of us are not smarter than any one of these markets, let alone the 42 markets combined together. And so uh, doing this iterative process on a daily basis for our clients, we can identify in real time, A, what the market regime is. Currently, it's reflation. 25 of those 42 markets are confirming it. That's the highest uh, share of the total. And more importantly, uh, which I think in terms of helping us stay on the right side of market risk or keeping our clients on the right side of market risk, is identifying when that changes. Specifically, for instance, you know, back in November when it changed from a risk off inflation to risk on Goldilocks, we said, hey, it's time to get very long, max bullish, do, every, do all the things that you would typically need to do in a Goldilocks regime, which is very similar to a reflation regime from a factor dispersion perspective. And then um, three weeks ago or four weeks ago, we said, hey, we're no longer in Goldilocks. It's reflation, similar factor dispersion purposes, but you got to get implementing more short fixed income markets. And so eventually, you know, something like inflation or deflation will creep up and, and become the new dominant regime. 
Uh, but for now, you know, we don't think it's appropriate as investors to do something materially different in your portfolio until we observe that change, right? Because again, the you know, volatile adjustable momentum signal, which is the primary tool we're using to score each of these markets, is a leading indicator for big phase transitions in, in price momentum and asset markets. And so that, that's why this process works. Got it. I want to stay on inflation because, you know, following your stuff, you've mentioned that the March CPI and PPI data confirm that sticky inflation theme. Am I right on that? That is very much correct, my friend. Uh, I mean, to pick your indicator, I mean, I guess the most important, one of the more important ones, if you look at Supercore uh, CPI, uh, that number accelerated to 7.9% through methangalized, like triple the pre-COVID trend and obviously moving in the wrong direction uh, as it relates to the Fed's uh, 2% inflation target. So, you know, at pretty much every material uh, subcategory of CPI, PPI, and also the leading indicators like the NFIB Feds, the NFIB survey or the University of Michigan survey that we got on Friday, you know, last week was a really challenging week for the immaculate disinflation narrative. We officially said the immaculate dis disinflation narrative is dead. And really, in our opinion, our Jay and Janet want a soft landing theme, which it's the, the key takeaway of that theme is uh, the Fed is more dovish than it needs to be. Uh, and the Treasury market is doing positive things from the perspective of liquidity in this election year. As long as those two things can be, uh, remain, uh, remain um, ongoing or, or, or persistent, then we don't have to necessarily be worried about the advent of sticky inflation as investors, because ultimately we're just going to get a more higher nominal GDP economy that the Fed isn't doing anything about or the Treasury isn't doing anything about. It's when they start to do something about it, when investors start to really price in a more trending risk off condition in asset markets. And again, I'm not sure we're there yet. So this is really different from where we were in November. And I guess from my perspective, I'm trying to understand if the inflation is sticky, how should investors be perceiving the market? Is this bullish? Is this bearish? Is it just range bound? Is it just come down to Darius? And I think you just said this is that maybe we don't know until the Fed does start to do something or we actually see them really truly be tested on their word, I think is something important because they've been talking dovish, like you've mentioned, but are they actually going to do something about it? Or are they going to be in a situation even where we think that they shouldn't cut rates and they do? I mean, I think we're kind of in this unique time where maybe the Fed does get tested here. Yeah. Again, I think they're going to get tested. Uh, I don't think they're going to get tested here in the second quarter because, again, the Fed is already guided to, to helping investors understand the disinflation process is going to be bumpy and uneven. That's what we heard in the most recent Fed minutes. That's what Jay Powell stressed in the March FOMC. Uh, he also stressed that the Fed is comfortable with inflation returning to 2%, back to the 2% target over time. The over time, it's the over time that he's stressing, which if you're reading the tea leaves appropriately, in our opinion, that over time stressing just means that, hey, we are comfortable with inflation being higher than our 2% target for longer. So the higher for longer that asset markets have latched on to, you know, throughout this last, you know, so, so a couple of quarters is the fact that the Fed is comfortable with higher inflation for longer, which is why they continue to guide to rate cuts. I mean, if you look at the most recent dot plot, talking about three rate cuts this year, three rate cuts next year, three rate cuts the year after that. I mean, asset, the money markets are not as aggressive in terms of what pricing is. I think the money markets are currently pricing in two rate cuts this year two the following year in 2025 and one in 2026 before they get to the terminal rate. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. But the fact that the Fed is guiding to rate cuts at all in the context of inflation being obviously uh, well above trend and, and obviously moving in the wrong direction is at least according to the most recent data, uh, in our opinion, suggests that this is a Fed that is acquiescing to fiscal dominance. You know, this is, in our opinion, one of the, the biggest changes that we've seen from a regime standpoint as investors in recent years uh, is the dominance of the fiscal authority relative to the monetary authority. You know, the 2010s and, you know, the post -car the post crisis era was a real monetary dominant regime in terms of that factor leadership and, and how you generally wanted to be positioned as an investor. You know, post COVID era, the regime has been a more of a fiscally dominant regime in which, you know, treasury supply and massively inflated federal budget deficits are having, you know, sort of, um, I would say, interesting impacts on, on asset markets and the economy, certainly relative to what we got used to as investors in the prior regime. So, I think this is a Fed that is being forced to acquiesce to fiscal dominance. And, and, and that result of that is this is a Fed that just is going to accept higher inflation and not going to do anything about it. Now, again, I think inflation, if it misbehaves more materially, like in our model suggests that it's likely to misbehave more materially uh, in Q4 and in Q1 of next year, that's a Fed that may be forced, you know, just from a political standpoint to, to, to do something more, i.e. guide to higher for longer on the policy rate front and taking out all those rate cuts, or they could guide to uh, rate hikes potentially in that environment if the economy remains resilient, which we suspect it will be. But again, I don't think we're there yet for this particular discussion. What I think the markets are really latched on to appropriately so and something we've benefited and our clients have benefited from is the fact that the Fed uh, is a lot more dovish than current or prospective nominal GDP trends warrant. And so is that 
why it's still risk on in your opinion yeah yeah for now at least yeah absolutely again risk off could come anytime i mean the, what we try to do here is in, in, as investors uh, going back to that that slide where we showed our risk management process we help investors prepare for regime change using quantitative signals if you look at the current constellation of composite signals in the macro weather model you know we have a you know a middling probability of surviving in the risk on condition over the next three months you know we're expecting as macro weather models expecting baseline returns from the stock market bond market us dollar and commodities over the next three months and above baseline returns of bitcoin so that's a reasonably positive environment based on the evolution and trends and dispersion across the principal components of macro whether it be real economy or financial economy so that's positive but then when you layer on our uh, fundamental research which is the second leg of that stool you know what's happening you know from the set of fundamental research to uh, help investors prepare for regime change again we still have those active themes that are telling investors that hey a lot of the positive things that have that have caused uh asset markets to you know be in this risk on condition from november through now uh those themes are generally still persistent now we lost one of them last week in terms of the death of the immaculate disinflation theme and the, and the birth of the sticky inflation theme uh, but again I, I don't think that in isolation is strong enough to cause a row row phase transition in asset markets because again the fed and the treasury are not doing anything about it once they start doing something about it or guiding to doing something about it that in my opinion is when the risk of a transition from risk on reflation to perhaps risk off inflation is likely to be more salient and more likely and more durable i mean that's one of the things i love about your work is that you stay very much in the moment even though you might be projecting forward of potential situations you're saying right now this is still the environment and until you see something actually make that change where that change actually happens you stay true to it because i think that's one of the most difficult things when you follow people's macro work is that they're projecting so much further away than where we are right now it's not actionable and so when you say we're still risk on because of these reasons i understand it but it's like you do know that at any point in time as somebody who follows your stuff that could change based upon the information and what activity happens in the market at that moment and then it's okay to shift so it's also not being uh scared to stay with something until it changes and trying to get way too far ahead of yourself which is where i think a lot of people get a lot of times darius yeah no i thank you for saying that because you know one of the things that I, we were coaching our, our our clients in our community today uh was just helping them remind them that hey there are three ways you generally be wrong as an investor you know we lose lots of money as an investor one is not identifying regime change and obviously not doing anything about it two is being materially late to regime change because you don't have a process that can spot it in real time early enough for you to do something about it or what I think most investors are doing and what you're alluding to, Anthony, which is incorrectly anticipating regime change. Exactly. Right? Like if you're just consistently and, and incorrectly anticipating regime change. I, you have this fundamental view that dictates markets have to change from their current condition to price in that fundamental view so that you can make money. That's where invest, a lot of investors are wrong because the reality is most people suck at predicting the future. We know that. Most institutional investors suck at predicting the future. So what do you what do you expect to do as a retail investor? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's so true. Yeah, totally. And so the reality is one thing we can take advantage of as asset as, as market participants is the fact that you know momentum is a real thing. Markets trend yeah, more exactly. than anything else. They trend more so than they inflect and trend. And so the reality is we've built our entire risk management process, as we highlighted in that previous slide, to take advantage of market momentum, right? It's not my job to tell the market that it needs to be pricing in Goldilocks or it needs to be pricing in reflation or it needs to be pricing in inflation or it needs to be pricing in deflation. If I want to make money as an investor, I can't tell the market what to do. I have to take advantage of what the market is doing. And that's exactly. how the money flows into my account. I've always said you can't impose your will on the market. You'll never win. <laughs> I can impose my will on a lot of a lot of a lot of defensive <laughs> linemen, man. <laughs> Two time all line the all-American left tackle. And I tell you what, you know, it's, uh, imposing your will on humans is a lot easier than imposing your will on the market. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, know. I mean, and as a short term day trader who focuses mostly on technicals, one of the main reasons why I feel like your work is so helpful for people like myself is because it keeps me within the context of the environment. And if the technicals are supporting that still, like we see this pullback in the market and I think to your work and it's like, okay, it's still risk on and I'm still, I look at it as a puzzle and the technicals might break down temporarily, but if they regain themselves and nothing has changed in that macro environment, that helps me better navigate on the short term, which really takes me to the next market that, you know, is really up for debate a lot lately. I've been seeing as to why gold is surging to all time highs. What do you believe is the driving force behind this move in gold? Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, it's as clear as day that it's, it's geopolitical. There's a geopolitical bid in gold. 
I mean, historically, you know, gold tends to be inversely correlated. If you look at it on a long, on a full cycle basis, the two dominant drivers of gold in, in terms of, you know, being kind of cyclical drivers are U.S. dollar uh, and then real interest rate, particularly the real 10-year tip seal. Those will be the dominant drivers on gold across multiple market cycles. Uh, now, again, the drivers of gold are less stable than they are for most asset markets over time. So what could cause the gold price to go up or go down on any particular you know, cross section of data? It can be very different from another cross section of data for gold, whereas for something like the S&P or the credit market, that's not as true. You know, the, the only causes the stock market to go up is, you know, earnings and liquidity and things of that nature, whereas gold could be a lot, a lot of other different things that fluctuate over time. But going back to what's driving this gold price, the things that are most stable in the context of not being particularly stable in absolute terms, but the things that are most stable in terms of driving the gold price higher are declining dollar and declining real interest rates. And right now, both the dollar and real interest rates are trending higher alongside gold, which tells you that there is something else in this particular cross section of data that is driving the gold price higher. In our opinion, that's uh, very much the geopolitical bit. Um, one of the things we did today uh, was introduce uh, in our options overlay product uh, was introduce a uh, put spread collar on gold because our model ultimately believes that, hey, you're in a risk on reflation market regime. Gold should not be up on a rope here, uh, especially now with, you know, 10 year to real to treasury yields having um, uh, risen to the extent that they have, not with the dollar has risen to the extent that it has. So there's probably a big pullback uh, in gold uh, coming in the coming weeks, in our opinion. Uh, that doesn't mean you, you can't buy that tip, but we'd be very cautious here uh, in the context of gold kind of breaking out on things that historically are not stable, like geopolitical bids. So that's the differential. I mean, that's where I'm seeing the argument. A lot of people will say gold is a hedge against central banks, right? And then you look at what's happening and I say, well, the theme doesn't kind of fit in this current environment, right? And then you go and look at geopolitical headwinds. And I know that we said that there has been some, and they're heating up as of late, but this moving gold has been going on for longer than that. So I don't know if it's just anticipating that or what else is it? Because the move didn't just start as the Middle East starts to heat up. It's been going on longer. And so I'm, I guess I'm kind of curious at what point in your mind, models or did you guys start to look at that and say this is why gold is doing this and we have to factor that in because of x yeah so we do that on a daily basis in terms of when we refresh our positioning model of all the indicators that we have in our model all the main mark the main drivers of asset markets you know things like you know the dollar interest rates you know the s p you know bitcoin and the crypto market of the things that have been driving gold it's, it's been naturally inversely correlated to u.s liquidity the most of the, the more dominant things which makes very little sense Obviously, it tells you that there is something that is not trackable that's driving the gold, gold price higher. Um, and so in our opinion, we crack, call me lazy. I think the lazy thing to do is assign, to assign a geopolitical bit to it. But the reality is we're only doing that after having done the quantitative research to understand that the things that typically drive gold are not driving gold in this current moment. So, you know, the one thing I will say is um, if I can share my screen again. Uh, where we show our, our volatility adjusted momentum signal for, for gold. Gold has been neutral in the context of our how our volatility adjusted momentum signal works. And so uh, just a quick background for those who may be unfamiliar. We don't only care about price momentum here uh, because we know that volatility at phase transitions historically has been a leading indicator for price, both to the upside in price, but also to the downside in price and, and, and more, uh, simple, more, more forcefully to the downside in price. Vol tends to break out or break down faster than price momentum tends to break out and break down. And so that's kind of the key takeaway there and why we built the model that way. So what a bullish signal uh, means in this, in the context of this model suggests that, hey, price momentum is trending higher and the volatility characteristics of that asset class are trending in a direction that support that positive price momentum. When a signal is bearish, that means the price momentum of the asset is trending lower and the volatility characteristics of that asset are trending in a direction that supports that bearish price momentum. When an asset is neutral, it means that the price could be trending higher or lower but that volatility is not confirming that uptrend or downtrend in price. And that's exactly what we're seeing in gold here. It doesn't mean that the uptrend in price doesn't exist. You can, you can make money on the uptrend in price, but you need to know that historically, you know, particularly in assets like gold, and this is true in every asset, you know, we see it here in the dollar, we see it here in gold, we see it here in gold again, which is when you have these big run-ups or run-downs in the price in a neutral regime setting, they get retraced more forcefully and more quickly than, you know, your standard garden variety pullbacks in a bullish regime or your standard, you know, kind of rips in a, in a bearish regime. And so that's something that investors need to be aware of that, hey, you know, this is a kind of a dangerous setup to be chasing. You would like to chase it a lot more if it was actually bullish and the volatility characteristics were confirming that bullish price momentum. But because they're not, we would suggest that there's a decent amount of downside risk in gold over the, you know, short to medium term, because again, you know, the things that historically will keep people buying the dip or keep people's position sizes, you know, unchanged in a pullback 
are just not there. That fundamental support is just not there. What about silver and copper? I mean, I looked at the chart of copper before we came on today, and yet again, another you know new high just exploding. I mean, I know they're very different than gold, right? I mean, their use cases are pretty different, similar maybe in some ways, but what is the reasoning and the driving force behind their moves? Yeah, so that, in our opinion, the, the driving force behind the moves is that we're in a risk on reflation market regime that's being driven by positive economic surprises, both domestically and globally, and also in simultaneous uptrends in U.S. and global liquidity. And those are the things that are contributing to the risk on reflation market regime, of which silver and copper are obvious beneficiaries of, uh, going back to that table we showed in our process slide. And so both silver and copper are bullish from the perspective of our volatility adjustment momentum signal. They should be bullish in a risk on market regime. And so our discretionary risk management overlay uh, is currently recommending a, a max loan position in those types of um, those types of exposures. Interesting time, isn't it, Darius, when you look at what's happening there? I just, it's in my years, it's, I, I don't remember a time where you've seen these types of things happening, like silver and copper going up for different reasons than gold's going up. I'm not saying that they're ever very closely tied, but they're, they're different drivers, right? But you're seeing these metals move up. You're seeing what's happening in rates. And, and there's just, just so many different things going on, all these crosswinds. I want to talk to you about if there are any specific, maybe long-term investment trends that maybe you're seeing that you're particularly bullish or bearish on? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the, the most obvious thing that we see on our screens today is the structural mispricing in the treasury market, from my opinion. You know, if you look at term premium in the treasury market, they're somewhere, you know, they're still slightly negative. Um, the median, the mean term premium over the long term in the treasury market is somewhere around 150 basis points. Uh, if you think about what could potentially drive term premium higher uh, in the treasury market, uh, you think about the, you know, kind of the advent of these sort of record fiscal deficits, you know, as a share of GDP on a non-recession or sort of non-recession, non-war basis, you know, it's very unusual to have such high budget deficits, particularly when the unemployment rate is as low as it is, you know, somewhere around, I want to say 3.8%. And so to me, the likelihood that we see a significant positive shock to supply in the treasury market over the coming decade is quite high from the perspective of our analysis of the four turning. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Neil Howe, my former colleague and one of my mentors, uh, his work on the fourth turning and, and how that, you know, the generational cycles tend to produce geopolitical outcomes in, in the economy, social, in social outcomes in the economy. You know, we took that work a step further and said, okay, said, okay what should you expect as an investor in a fourth turning uh, from the perspective of the economy, from the perspective of the policy response, and ultimately from the perspective of asset markets? And one of the key takeaways, uh, one of the more salient takeaways uh, was that, you know, the size of the government uh, and the size of government debts tend to explode in a fourth turning. And so I think investors need to be very serious and cognizant that, you know, even though CBO and Treasury and Jeff Gunlack and Sam Druckenmiller projections of, you know, where Treasury supply is going to be over the next in the coming decade plus, uh, they're very high. We would say take the over on those numbers uh, in the context of uh, what's likely to occur in the fourth turning from the perspective of, you know, something that could be as serious as a total U.S. getting involved in a total war. So that's one of the more longer term themes uh, we're focused on. Uh, ultimately, we, we expect uh, this uh, sort of era of fiscal dominance that is part and parcel with this fourth turning regime to manifest its way into the Fed being forced to accept 3% inflation. Uh, right now, you know, one of the things that's kept us structurally bullish, and we pivoted a little bit late uh, back in January of 2023, not late relative to the average investor, but late relative to my you know, track record on Wall Street being be usually better than that. Uh, but, uh, you know, back in January 2023, when we pivoted bullish, we understood, hey, that this is a Fed that is, you know, just structurally easier than it probably should be. The Fed put is not only back, but it may be even back in a, with, a, with a vengeance if you think about their re response to the um, uh, the regional banking crisis. And so uh, from our perspective, it's not very clear, but from our perspective, it's very clear. I don't know that it's very clear to the average investor yet, but we believe this is a Fed that when faced with the choice of 2% inflation and a recession or 3% inflation and a, and a resilient economy, we think they're going to choose the latter 99 times out of 100. Uh, and then that is structurally bullish for risk assets like stocks, credit, crypto and commodities, and is structurally bearish for, uh, you know, defensive assets like treasuries and the U.S. dollar. And so that doesn't mean that treasury and dollar are going to go down every day, every week, every month, every quarter, and all the rest of those assets are going to go up every day, every week, every month, every quarter. But I think as an investor, you need to understand that, hey, this is a Fed that's going to be forced to accept, acquiesce to a higher nominal GDP environment that they're used to from a populist standpoint. Uh, because that's what the, the population will demand from a voting perspective. But there's also a uh, Fed that's going to be forced to acquiesce to more treasury supply uh, than they're probably expecting currently. Uh, and as a function of that, we're probably going to see, you know, financial repression, current financial repression, currency debasement and things of that nature. So, you know, we are structurally long term bulls on, you know, your average risk asset 
uh, you know, your average financial asset relative to something like a treasury bond or relative to something like U.S. dollar or unit of U.S. dollars. Uh, doesn't mean those things are going to go up. You know, the things that we like are going to go up uh, every day long term. But I think, you know, you have to understand where you are in that that grid regime cycle, that Goldilocks, reflation, inflation, deflation cycle, so that, you know, you when you're pivoting into a risk on market regime, OK, you know that, hey, I got to be taking these risks. I got to take advantage of this, this cyclical upswing. But when you're pivoting to that risk off market regime, you understand that, hey, you know, the, this trade, even though we're structurally bullish, it's probably not going to work for the next one, two, three, four, five months. So thinking about those long term trends, what regime would start to come into play to where those then would become current themes? Yeah. So we're effectively arguing that the frequency of reflation market regimes will increase. You know, we've had a high frequency of Goldilocks market regimes and a high frequency of deflation market regimes. That's that Goldilocks is growth, real growth accelerating with inflation declining. Uh, deflation is real growth declining with inflation declining. That was kind of the pivot back and forth pivot in the most previous era, you know, the post-crisis era, uh, you know, basically oscillating between Goldilocks and deflation. Because of this era of fiscal dominance, this fourth turning populism that we continue to see in fiscal policy, and no matter who wins the election in November, we're going to continue to see fourth turning populism and fiscal policy essentially the same in that regard. And so we think this is an era where uh, the frequency of reflation market regimes, risk on reflation, the risk off inflation, uh, which is, you know, similar to reflation, but, you know, it's risk off for at risk assets. You know, we think that, that that frequency of those two regimes will increase relative to the frequency of Goldilocks and deflation. So that's like the main regime pivot that we're seeing from a structural perspective. But again, as an investor, it's not my job to say, I think we're going to be there by such and such a date. Therefore, you got to do this in your portfolio. If you want to make and save money along the way, you have to respect the path the market chooses to take to get to that outcome. And in my opinion, that's what we do here at 42 Macro is identify the path that the market is choosing to take. And we're helping investors position their portfolios with the right factor bets to take advantage of that path that the market has been choosing to take. We know where it's going five, 10 years from now, but we have to understand and respect that path. And so I think that's something we do a great job of, of keeping our clients on, on the right side of market risk because of that. Yeah, you do do a fantastic job at that. And you and I have had this discussion before about executing the path, right? If you want to be a good uh, trader or an investor, it's about executing the path. It's not just about making a call so far out or even in the short term, you have to execute to get there. Totally. <laughs> because the market is never going to get there in a linear fashion. We know that much. Yeah. Based on your experience, what advice would you give to the individual investors out there navigating this current difficult economic landscape? Ooh, that's a great question, man. What advice? Um, humility and, and be dispassionate. You know, I, even today I can tell in our own client base, you know, when I'm interacting with our clients in our community portal or in our, in our community dashboard, we have a, a client feature. A chat feature today that they, they you know they, they our clients interact with me on and and you know just reminding investors that hey like it's you know when you wake up to Iran bombing Israel and you know it's a lot very easy to see one percent down day see that headline and go oh my god I got to do something different today you know this is a signal I got to do something different today but the you know the one thing I would stress is okay you know if your primary risk management process the, the process that got you into the positions has not changed signal you should not be changing your portfolio. You know, wake up, refresh the models, you know, read what you need to read and go back to your busy day. Um, you, know, you know, don't feel like you need to make an investment decision every single time there's a new headline or every single time the market moves more than you, quote unquote, expected it to in a short interval of time. You know, that may be a signal, but most of the time it isn't. Most of the time it's, it's bait. It's sucking you in to make the exact wrong decision at the worst possible time. And that's what markets do. The markets punish people who are emotional and passionate about what they're doing. You need to be unemotional and dispassionate if you want to consistently uh, make money and protect gains in financial markets. And that's something we try to, that's the number one thing we sell to our clients is, is market timing with dispassionate execution. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And, you know, today is a special day for you. You know, I'm a huge fan of yours. Hard to find anyone more passionate about this business than you. And I've gotten to know you over the years and tell everybody why today's uh, a pretty special day for you and 42 Macro. Well, I appreciate you, Anthony, man. Um, you know, I, I would say your passion is very much up there, man. You know, I, I've learned a lot from you as well over the years. And like, you know, just, um, you know, just on, in terms of um, Jack Robinson Day, this is a big day for me personally. Um, you know, so Jackie Robinson, our, obviously our company's named 42 Macro. Uh, that's an ode to Jackie Robinson. It's really uh, an ode to the uh, a lifetime of poverty uh, that he had to overcome. It's a life, It's an ode to the institutionalized racism uh, that he had to overcome uh, to demonstrate the excellence that he demonstrated on a consistent basis. Uh, and those are two things that I've had to overcome personally uh, with my story and my struggle to demonstrate the excellence that our clients see every day from us here at 42 Macro. So Jackie Robinson is one of my heroes and, and certainly obviously something, someone I, I feel strongly enough about 
uh, to name our company after. So uh, appreciate him. I'm grateful that it's Jackie Robinson Day. Happy Jackie Robinson Day to everyone out there uh, that believes in you know democratizing uh, what it is that we're democratizing, which is in our opinion with you, Anthony, as well, is the, the upper echelons of, of institutional risk management. You know, th this is a very, very hard game. Uh, a lot of investors are deluded by TikTok and, and Instagram that thinking that this is easy. And there are times where it is easy, but for the most part, if you're trying to compound returns over time, and then more importantly, if you're a retail investor, you know, build a, a sizable enough uh, of a retirement account so that you can retire on time and comfortably, you know, it's a hard thing to do. And you definitely need resources to do that at a high level so that you're not making terrible mistakes at the worst possible times. And so uh, even if it's not with us or if it's not with Anthony, I highly recommend you find someone that is pro has a proven track record at helping investors do this in terms of achieving those investment objectives. So uh, thanks again, Anthony, for having me on the show. Uh, again, happy Jackie Robinson Day out there to everyone that believes in democratization, believes in uh, having a little brown brother like myself, uh, you know, uh, preach some knowledge to you guys. I appreciate you. DD, not only are you one of the best macro guys out there, you're one of the best people. It's no. always an honor and privilege to have you on the show. I appreciate you so much. And thank you so much for shedding some light on what's happening in this difficult environment. You're the best, buddy. Thank you so much. Likewise, Anthony. Likewise. And I appreciate you, man. I look forward to next time, brother.